All right, welcome. My name is Ryan Hoger. I'm with Temperature Equipment Corporation. Uh, this week's webinar topic is Panasonic Variable Refrigerant Flow Systems. And you can see we also have Sanyo listed up in the top of the header there. That's because this product line was originally branded Sanyo. And when Panasonic bought them a year or two ago, they've converted all the branding and logoing over to the Panasonic name. So we're trying to kind of phase out the Sanyo name and just stick with Panasonic. But uh, depending on which cool pictures I have, like the one on the screen here, some of them still may say Sanyo. All right, so we're going to talk about variable refrigerant flow as, a, as an application and a concept. We'll talk about it from a general industry standpoint. We'll talk specifically about some of the Panasonic products. We'll talk about uh, energy consumption usage. Uh, we'll talk about piping scenarios. We'll talk about comparing it against rooftops or chiller systems. We'll try to hit everything here in about an hour, hour and 10 minutes or something like that. If you have questions as we go, just type them in the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner, and periodically I will check that just to see if we have any, uh, any questions we can try to answer on the fly as we go. All right, so the first thing in understanding a variable refrigerant flow system is getting a basic understanding of what a heat pump is, because all VRF systems, at least every one that I've seen from any manufacturer in the past 10 years, has been a heat pump system. Um, so a heat pump in its most basic form is basically, well, the first thing you got to understand is how an air conditioner operates uh, and how you can explain that to an end, end user, if you will. Uh, and the first thing to understand about an air conditioner is that it's not making things cold. It's basically removing their heat. Um, so if you look over here, and I assume you guys can probably see my, uh, my mouse on the screen here, uh, the top drawing there in the summertime, your regular air conditioner at your house is using the evaporator coil indoors to suck heat out of the indoor air and pass that heat through the refrigerant system and reject that heat outside. Well, what a heat pump does is it basically reverses the flow of refrigerant and the indoor coil now becomes your condensing coil and your outdoor coil becomes your evaporator coil and everything operates in reverse. So we literally suck heat from the outdoors, suck it through the refrigerant line and dump the heat, if you will, into the indoor air of your home or your building. So a heat pump is exactly like an air conditioner. All we've done is take your condensing unit and shoved it inside your building and taking your evaporator coil and stuck it outside. Other than that, everything is basically the same. Um, so that's probably the easiest way to explain it to end users. We're sucking heat out of the outdoors and bringing it to the inside. And you'll probably get some arguments from people, well, it's colder outside, how can I do that? Well, in the summertime, where your air conditioner is running normal, it's colder in your house, if you will, than it is outside, and you can still do it. So it's a whole discussion on refrigeration, but it's basically the same thing. Some of the problems that people have objected about heat pumps over the decades uh, especially in the northern area, is that they blow cold air. Um, so we'll try to address that here in a minute. Uh, we get a lot of people saying, oh, you can't use them in cold climates. We'll address that here in a minute. Uh, serviceability, they're too hard to service. Um, it is a little bit harder than a regular air conditioning system because I have a reversing valve in there. I have one more component than I otherwise would have, and that component needs to be wired to and controlled on a traditional system. So there is a little bit more work in that regard. However, with a VRF system, those controls are all packaged in the unit, factory installed, and you don't have to mess with anything, any of that. So the serviceability might be slightly harder than a traditional system, but that's just because folks in the Midwest aren't extremely familiar with heat pumps yet. Uh, the reliability factor, uh, this, is, this is a non-issue in my mind. Um, heat pumps in general, especially variable speed heat pumps that we have sold through our office, whether they're VRF or traditional, I guess tr traditional is a bad word, regular variable speed heat pumps have had better, lower warranty claims than other products have. And in fact, I don't believe in the almost five years we've been doing this annual VRF system that we've ever had to replace a compressor for anybody. Um, it's not a high failure item. It's well-engineered stuff. And generally speaking, variable components last much longer than on-off components in our industry in general. We'll talk specifically about the expense and the payback stuff as we get towards the end over here. So the first one, uh, discharge air control. As you can see, the blue line is a standard, traditional, non-variable speed heat pump, if you will. The grid across the bottom is outdoor air temperature. The vertical uh, line is the leaving air temperature from the indoor unit. Generally speaking, the colder it gets outside, the less heat I can produce. So the cooler and cooler my discharge air gets until you see I get down to this case 15, 17 degrees. And now I'm at 85 degrees discharge and below. Anytime the discharge air and the heating mode is cooler than the skin temperature of people, which is probably about 92 degrees, it's going to feel a bit cool to them. So really you want to keep it above 100 degrees or so. 
uh, and you'll and you'll keep the perception that it's warm. Now, can I heat your building with 85 degree supply air? Absolutely, all day long. Nearly every building can be heated with 85 degree supply air. It's just that it feels cool on your skin. With the variable speed heat pump, however, we try to keep that discharge air temperature higher as longer as possible, and that's because we do have control over the condenser fan speed on a variable speed unit. Not only is the compressor variable speed, but as as is the condenser fan. So we can actually slow that condenser fan down to have the outdoor air remain in contact with the coil longer to extract more heat out of that air. And then additionally, on the indoor coil, we can slow the fans down as well to have the same kind of effect to keep that coil in contact with the air molecules longer, which gives me a higher discharge air temperature. Now, at some point, I'm going to run out of capacity, and I'm going to have to start speeding the fan up to get more BTUs. And that's when you'll see here on the red line that the discharge air temperature could drop off. As far as using it in cold climates, um, talking to some of the, the manufacturers, not even manufacturers of VRF, just manufacturers of heat pumps in general, uh, like Carrier and those folks, um, Wisconsin and Minnesota are two of the top five heat pump selling states in the country. So if we can use them in Wisconsin and Minnesota, I'm pretty sure we can get away with it down here in Chicago. Uh, we've been using heat pumps for decades and decades here. It just hasn't always been the most popular choice, but it certainly is a functional choice. To give you a look at some of the weather data in this discussion, if you look here at Chicago, which is where most of the people logging in are from, that third line down, um, total bin hours is 6,000. Bin hours is how many hours we have in the year. So there's 8,760 hours in the year, I believe. 6,000 of them are what we would call heating mode, meaning that it's below 65 degrees outside. So 6,000 of the 8,700 hours of the year, we basically need some form of heat in most buildings. Uh, obviously, there's commercial buildings that are cooling dominant, but we're talking about heating at the moment here. Um, if we look at hours between 30 and 65, that's 4,500. So 4,500 of the 8,700, basically half of the hours, um, actually half of the hours of the year, but three quarters of the heating hours are above 30 degrees. And if I look at 20 to 65 degrees outdoor temperature, it's 5,400 hours, um, which is 90% of my heating hours. So 90% of my heating hours are between 20 and 65 degrees, which is prime time for a heat pump to operate. That's when you get the most capacity and the greatest efficiency out of a heat pump. I know in the Chicago and in the Midwest, we like to think about these zero and minus five, minus 10, minus 15 degree days. But that really is the exception to the rule. The vast majority of the time, it is above 20 degrees outside. Uh, so heat pumps can thrive there. Additionally, as you're gonna see in a little while, we can run these heat pumps down to minus 10 degrees and heat on those kind of days as well. Um, but the main time that we'll be doing it is when heat pumps are awesome, which is 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees outside. And that just shows it to you kind of pictorially um, for Chicago area. Uh, you can see how yeah, we do get some days where it's minus 10 and zero, but it's very few hours of the year. You can see the bulk of the run hours that we have um, in each one of these bars going across is, is 100 hours of the year. Uh, the bulk of the hours are in the 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 30 to 70 degree range. Um, right here in the middle is the bulk of my run hours, which is ideal for a heat pump once again. Um, VRF is not a new thing at all. Um, it, it does seem like it's fairly new in the United States here because it's, been, it's really only been kind of a, a vogue thing for the past five years or so, and really most of us started hearing about it seven, eight, ten years ago. Um, but it is fairly new to the U.S., but globally it's been around for, for quite some time. We're talking about a technology that, that was really first started to be developed and marketed about 30 years ago. Uh, it is predominant in the, in the Asian countries. So VRF systems for, say, office buildings are the dominant system choice, uh, significantly more common than chilled water or, um, or air side systems. So if you go to Japan, China, Malaysia, any of these places, VRF is going to be the most common choice for office building type environments. Uh, additionally, if you go to Europe, um, while you know hot water boilers are still the primary choice there. Um, VRF is more common than, than is an airside system like VAV, for example. Uh, only in the United States and probably Canada are airside systems the primary choice for heating and cooling the building. Pretty much everywhere else in the world where energy is usually more expensive than us, they are often using something that is liquid-based, water or refrigerant to distribute as opposed to distributing with air. Um, the other thing to point out on here is 2011, we finally got an AHRI standard for VRF systems to help kind of compare different systems against each other from a capacity and energy standpoint. And I'll show you some of that info as we go along here too. 
So what exactly is a VRF system? VRF stands for Variable Refrigerant Flow. That's the industry term that the seven or eight manufacturers use to describe their system. You may hear VRF, Variable Refrigerant Volume. Uh, that is a trademark term from one specific manufacturer. But the industry generic is, is VRF. And what we're really talking about is taking one condensing unit, or one outdoor unit, if you will, heat pump, and having that unit provide refrigerant to multiple indoor units. Additionally, we can gang up two or three of these outdoor units together to get additional capacities, and I'll show you that. Um, but So one, two, or three outdoor units manifolded and connected to three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40 of these uh, indoor units. So they're all sharing refrigerant from the same outdoor units. Very similar to what we do on the air side with the VAB system. I might have 30 VAB dampers all being fed by a single air handler. Same kind of thing here, but instead of air, we're moving refrigerant. Um, you can mix and match indoor unit types. You can have the traditional duct-free split high wall type stuff. You can have ducted units, cassette units, console units, air handler closet units. There's all kinds of choices, and you can mix them on a given job. Um, controls are all built into these things, so the outdoor units and the indoor units from every manufacturer come standard with DDC controls in them, and then you in the field are just wiring those devices together so they can share data uh, and doing some basic configuration. Um, most manufacturers, and I'll show you the piping scenarios in a little bit here, but most manufacturers use a two-pipe system for their regular heat pump units, and then if they want to do heat recovery, uh, and we'll talk about what heat recovery means, uh, there's typically a third pipe involved in the distribution network. So there gives you an example of the heat pump type scenario. Uh, it's typically a two-pipe system, and either the system is in cooling mode, as it shows in the top, or it's in heating mode, as we're showing in the bottom. It's one or the other at a given moment in time, not both. Um, the other way to do it is a heat recovery type system, where we can provide heat to, say, the perimeter zones and provide cooling to interior core zones at the same time, and each zone can pick whichever one they want because there is a third, third pipe available. And we'll dive into the sequence of how that operates here in a little bit. So buildings that are typically common targets for this, um, office buildings, globally speaking, are probably the biggest biggest market. Um, and what we've done here quite a bit at, at TEC over the past five years is a lot of retrofit work on existing buildings where maybe they didn't have a cooling system, and now they're trying to add cooling and be more efficient for their heating. Uh, we've done several uh, mid-rise type condo buildings, um, some loft type office buildings, a couple schools, things like that. Um, so some recent projects that some of the folks here in our office have done. Um, CHA is obviously a housing building. You can look at the building there and see that it was a retrofit. Uh, Van Buren is a loft style office building conversion, a nine or ten story building um, that we retrofitted and uh, have probably half of it's probably been leased out at this point, I believe. Um, so there's just some projects like that. I'll just pop a few of them up here so you can just kind of see some of the targets. A lot of them have to do with residential living or zoned type spaces of other types. Um, so it's a whole other discussion on those projects. The reason that, that folks like this type of system is the amount of energy that I can move per given space, if you will. So this is one way to, to look at that. A typical VAB system, which is obviously an air side distribution system, um, can typically, at 55 degree supply air, can move 7.7 .7 BTUs for every pound of air. A hydronic system is much better, three times better, if you will, on the cooling side, and we can move 20 BTUs per pound of water. Uh, and then refrigerant side, you can see there, we're talking about 115, 120 BTUs per pound of refrigerant that we can move. Another way to look at that is how much space does it take to move all that energy. So I can get a 16 by 48 inch duct and move X amount of energy. I can move that same energy with a 2 inch uh, chilled water line, obviously a supply and a 2 inch return. Or I can use a 7 8 and 3 8 inch line set with a refrigerant based system and move the same amount of energy. So in the space it takes me to put a 7 8 inch line set, I would have had to put a 16 by 48 inch supply duct to move the equivalent amount of cooling BTUs around. Um, so it, it is a pretty big difference in size, which is why this system lends itself very well to retrofit scenarios where there may not be ductwork already. Uh, we're looking at it one other way here, just a visual way to look at it, that sheet metal ductwork up there is, uh, is a 12-ton system, and the refrigerant piping there is serving 40 tons of condensing units. Um, so you can see how you know visually how much less space um, refrigerant piping takes versus, versus ductwork. 
Uh, on the left-hand side here shows you a typical, you know, mid-rise, high-rise type uh, building with a chilled water system. On the roof, we have a cooling tower. Down in the basement, we have our chiller. And then on each floor, we have the associated air handlers for that floor that are getting fed the chill water and supplying air throughout the space. Additionally, you'd have some kind of boiler in this basement as well, or perhaps electric heaters in the zones, but probably a boiler for a building this size. Over on the right, we're showing a typical air-cooled VRF system uh, where I have the uh, VRF outdoor units lined up on the roof there. In the space, they have ceiling cassette indoor units. The basement room, mechanical room, is no longer necessary. That can now become finishable, leasable, rentable type space. Um, also, I don't have air handlers on each floor taking up closet space. Um, so it does it does save some additional um, room around the building. Uh, it says eliminated or reduced ductwork. In most cases, you're probably not going to eliminate it because you're probably still going to want to have a mechanical ventilation system for outdoor air requirements. Uh, so reduced is more likely the scenario. But instead of bringing in, I don't know, 10,000 CFM of, of, of air through an air handler, maybe I only got to bring two or 3,000 CFM because the air is just the outside air. Uh, there's no return air path at the ducting level, if you will. So the ductwork does get reduced you know, by two-thirds approximately, depending on your system. Uh, as far as the Panasonic product goes, uh, these are kind of the tiers of VRF product that is available. Um, there's what we call the EcoEye Mini, which is the smaller units, three and five tons. And then there's the larger regular EcoEye units that come in either a two-way, so a two-pipe heat pump system, or a three-way, which is a three-pipe uh, heat recovery system. And those typically range from six to 24 tons. So there's the little Mini. Uh, it does have a horizontal discharge for the condensing unit air. Um, and it is a two-fan based system. Uh, it is reasonably quiet, 67, 68 dBA is, is pretty decent and certainly on par with traditional condensing unit systems, maybe even a little bit quieter. Uh, if you go up to the bigger units, the 6 and the 8 ton, they are more vertical in configuration. They take their uh, condenser air in from all four sides and discharge it out the top, as you can see where the fan is at there. Uh, additionally, um, these guys are much more quiet, uh, down to 55 dBA, which is pretty much beats most traditional condensing units as far as sound goes. And then you can manifold these together in any combination for the 6 and 8 ton unit. So I can put two 6 tons together to get a 12 ton system. So I can have these two 6 ton units manifold together to provide 12 tons of refrigerant down a single refrigerant distribution pipe down the building up to all my individual fan coils. Or I can get as many as three 8-ton units manifold together for a total of 24 tons. Now, that doesn't mean if I got a building with 50 tons or 100 tons, I can't do it. It just means I'm going to have multiple refrigerant piping networks taking care of you know, different wings or different floors or something like that. And we do have several buildings like that where we have m multiple systems in addition to multiple condensing units on one system. Uh, the three-way or three-pipe system is very similar. You can manifold uh, one, two, or three units together to get up to 24 tons of capacity per refrigerant system. If you guys have any questions as we're going, just type them in that chat box in the bottom right hand corner and I will try to take breaks and, uh, and answer them as we go. Um, you can fit a lot of these condensing units on, on a roof near each other. Uh, they can be as close as four inches between them, which is not something you would do with traditional American based products, uh, but it is fairly common with Panasonic and other VRF manufacturers. You can get these guys pretty close together because they are taking air in on all four sides. So if one side doesn't get quite as much, the other sides can make it up. Um, but there are specific you know, rules and in install manual on what you can do and can't do. Uh, but you can see from that picture over there, you can get quite a few of these together. And we started kind of jokingly calling these the, uh, the condensing unit farms. Um, so we can bank them all together and they're kind of popping up like, uh, like plants there. Uh, you can also take an air-cooled machine and put it indoors in some cases if you have an exterior wall available. So you can see in the bottom right-hand screen there, there's an indoor unit that's pulling, pulling air probably through a louver of one of these walls and then discharging it uh, up the top. There's kits available for that, uh, discharging it out the side wall. So you can't put these inside if you need to. You see they also added a condensate pump because obviously I have to have somewhere to, to send that water when this thing's in the heat pump mode. Um, we do also take advantage of diversity, much like we do on VAV systems and uh, chill water and hot water hydronic systems. We do the same thing on VRF. Um, we look at the loads of the individual zones and say, okay, you know, on a, on, on a, on a you know, worst case kind of day, how many zones would need you know, full cooling or full heating at the same time, right? If I got, if I got 40 zones, it's not going to be such that all 40 zones need 100% cooling at the exact same time. 
Um, so I can look at the load diversity based on the solar load and things like that and decide how many units, uh, how, how much, how I have to size this guy. Uh, but it's very common to be able to have 130% of the indoor units versus the outdoor units. So, you know, if I had 10 tons of, of outdoor unit, I would have, you know, 13 tons of indoor unit would not be uncommon. Sometimes we can go a little higher, sometimes a little less, depends on the building load profile. Um, so for the indoor units, there's several types of configurations available. There's a traditional high wall, um, which looks like a duct-free split style unit, same kind of, uh, you know, plastic housing that it would fit in. Um, and that's, you know, very commonly used in retrofit scenarios. Uh, you can see they only go from up to, up to two tons capacity, but they do go as small as 7,000 BTUs. So you can get some pretty small private offices on those. Uh, there are cassette models. This particular cassette um, recesses up into the ceiling, and it's a one-way blow. So return air comes in this grill here. Supply air comes out of this louver and the, when the louver opens, uh, and they go up to about one ton of capacity. If you need more than one ton, you're going to look at one that has a four-way blow where the return air comes up in the middle of the unit, and then the supply air discharges out all four directions. Um, installed in, in the ceiling grid, it looks fairly similar to uh, what a diffuser might look like on an air side system. Uh, and you can see these here are one ton and one and a half ton capacity. Uh, and then there's uh, larger ones that are two and three tons. The main difference, and why we're showing them differently here, is the small ones, they fit in a two by two standard ceiling grid. The big ones, because there's more airflow required, they can't fit in a two by two, so they're actually three foot by three foot. So they look a little bit different when they install them in the grid. Um, but nonetheless, um, you can get more airflow through them. A lot of these ones, as you can see noted on the bottom, have built-in condensate pumps already. Other ones, like the uh, like the high wall unit, you got to field supply the condensate pump, which is fairly common for duct-free split type stuff. But these cassette ones already have a pump built in. Um, there are also ones that recess below the ceiling for retrofit applications, like the one over here on the right-hand side. Uh, in this case, it's one, one and a half, and two ton capacities, field supplied condensate pump. There's council models, both cased and uncased, uh, that you can use for retrofitting where uh, cabinet unit heaters might have been previously and stuff like that, typically up to two tons in capacity. Uh, and then there's all the ducted type of units. Um, this one is a low-profile ducted unit. It goes from 7,000 BTUs in size up to a ton and a half. Uh, and these numbers in parentheses here are the static pressure availability, external static pressure availability. So you can see these, these low-profile ones do not, have a much, do not have much static available to them. But then again, this is only like a one-ton unit. You're not going to have a lot of duct work on it itself. Um, if you do need more static availability, there are other, other choices. These guys up, go up to about four-tenths or five-tenths of an inch of static and they range from 7,000 BTUs up to, uh, up to four and a half, what would that be, four and a half tons of capacity. Uh, and depending on the size, they either have two, three, or four uh, ready-to-go duct transitions off them, so you can have flex coming off them and going to individual diffusers. If you want to hard duct it yourself, um, I don't know if you can see here, there's knockouts here. You can take these off, and you can hard, hard duct to them instead of having these takeoffs already ready for you. Uh, and then there's the high static models, three and four tons. We can get up to 0 0.6, 0 0.7 inches of static on these guys. Um, and you can obviously duck them however you want at that point. And you can see in this drawing here, hanging one of these boxes is very similar to hanging a fan-powered VAV box. Uh, obviously, you've got to support the weight on either, you know, either an air side system or a refrigerant system. You've got electric going there to power the fan. You've got piping connection, although on a VAV system, it's hot water. On this system, it's a refrigerant pipe. And then you've got duct coming in and out. So from a labor standpoint, installing one of these boxes is very similar to installing a uh, fan-powered VAV box. Uh, I've got a question that popped up from Jessica. Typically, we see suppliers separated from the return air. How does it work with the one-ton units having both side-by-side? -side? Let me see. One-ton units side-by-side. -side. I'm assuming you're talking about like this kind of thing uh, that I have up on the picture here. Um, in this case, the return air is coming straight up the middle, and the supplier is going to be on, based on this louver, and it's going to be throwing it the way my mouse is going, if you can see that. Um, so you won't have recirculation. I'm assuming that's what you're referring to. Uh, if not, uh, we'll talk later offline and I'll understand your question better. Uh, John actually asks, is there an option for field units to bring in outside air? Uh, the answer is yes and no, depending on the unit. So I should have pointed that out. These high wall units, there's no option to have outside air coming through these. You would have a separate diffuser bringing outside air into the space or operable windows, which I'm not a big fan of, but you could do that. Um, however, some of these other units, like these ceiling cassette ones, they do have outside air intakes. They have knockouts on them 
where I can where I can bring in uh, a little bit of outside air. Typically, 10, 15 percent of the total supply air is pretty common. Um, but I can do that through some of these ceiling cassette style units, um, and as well as through obviously through these ducting units, I could certainly do that because I'm bringing the return air in myself with my own ducting. So the answer, John, is yes. You can you can do it depending on the model. I'll bring the outside air into it. All right, so um, some of the controls options that are available on these typical units, and then we'll get into some of the energy discussion and piping discussion. Uh, this is this grant here is just one snapshot here of the typical controls that would be available. You would not be using all of these things. You'd be picking which ones you want. So starting up on the top, handheld remote, very similar to other duct-free split type stuff you've seen before. We obviously love this option because people lose their remotes and they got to order new ones. Yay. Um, but from the end user standpoint, it's not ideal because people lose their remotes. Um, so you're better off with a wired solution in most cases. So the, the second one down here with non-programmable wired thermostat, that's a very common option. And then now with the energy codes being the way they are, the one right below it is the programmable version of that that most folks will choose. Um, you don't have to put a thermostat on these guys at all. Um, the Panasonic VRF indoor units come with a return air sensor already installed in them. And since they already have their own DDC controller, they are already set off to run off of that return air sensor. That's their normal mode of operation. Um, the time you would want to put a thermostat on the wall is if you want the end user, and the local end user in that room, to be able to have the ability to adjust set points and things like that. Um, so that's when you would use, use a thermostat over just the standard return air sensor. So these choices on the left-hand side are your options for the end user in the space to get some controllability of the system in terms of fan speed, set points, things like that. Uh, on the right-hand side are some options that we use for the, for the macro level, if you will, for the building to get some over, overall control. Uh, the first one there on the top is the system controller, which can handle up to 64 zones. I'm not a big fan of that one because I don't want to scroll through 64 zones on a little tiny screen like that. That's less than ideal. I'd rather use one of the other options, like the one on the bottom right-hand side here is a protocol gateway. This is, allows the VRF system to share its data, set points, current temperatures, alarm codes, things like that with a building automation system, be it BACnet, LAN, Modbus, um, Johnson N2, things like that. And then the other option uh, from Panasonic is their own um, mini BAS, if you will. Uh, if they don't, if they don't, if they got too many zones that, that, that this kind of thing doesn't make sense, but too, too few of zones that they're not going to put in a full automation system like a campus would or something, this is a nice compromise. It's a, it's a uh, touch screen panel that gets installed in the closet but it also has web access, so they can access it by logging into it. Um, and we can control up to 256 indoor units, which covers pretty much almost any normal normal uh, building size that we would be, be looking at. Uh, Aaron did ask a question and said, what about classrooms with 35 to 45% outside air requirements? Uh, in those cases, Aaron, if you want to use a VRF system, you'd be looking at using one of the ducted versions. If you want to bring that much air through the actual VRF uh, indoor unit itself, you'd be looking at using one of the ducted versions and you'd be pre-treating that outside air with an ERV because once you get above a certain percentage, the local energy code is going to require an ERV anyway, uh, and then you're not putting all the work on the refrigerant side. You're letting the exhaust air preheat, pre-cool um, your, your incoming ventilation air. Um, so that's going to be a typical way that, that you would do that scenario is with one of the ducted units where you can handle more, where you can pick and choose how much air comes from a return path or an outside air path. Uh, David asks, what units can be controlled via BAS? The high wall units cannot have this capacity true. Uh, that is not true. All of the indoor units we have um, can be hooked up with this protocol gateway. Um, if they're the VRF units, there are some of the duct-free split units uh, from Panasonic that would not have this ability. But from the VRF standpoint, we can put them all, all through there. Uh, there's a specific model number you're thinking of, David. Uh, let me know, and we'll go, we'll go research that one after, after today. Um, so web controller is another option. So they can have a local controller, they can have a building automation interface, or they can use the Panasonic web option. Um, from a wiring standpoint, this just kind of gives you a, an overshot of what, what the wiring uh, and piping might look like. So in the dark, thick lines, that's our refrigerant piping network, if you will. And the thin, smaller lines are um, um, wiring. So the refrigerant network, in this case, got an outdoor unit that's providing this is two pipes leaving here, or three pipes, depending on the scenario. And then you're branching off to individual zones. And as you go further away from the condensing unit, the pipe gets smaller and smaller and smaller, just like you would with a ducting type system, right? Uh, and then each of those units is communicated over a daisy chain communication cable. 
typically a three-wire communication bus, sometimes two, depending on what we're trying to do here, uh, going from one to the next. The outdoor unit also ties into that. In this example, there are three systems like that, uh, so three distinct refrigeration systems. But then from a control standpoint, all three of the controls are networked together and in this case brought into the building automation system. All right, so basic functionality of how these VRF units operate. So in this example here, we have one, a, one outdoor unit. I think this is an eight ton, providing air to four indoor units. So if I look at these guys, it's a three ton, a three ton, a two ton, and a two ton. And at the given moment, so what is that? That's uh, 10 tons of indoor capacity, only eight, ton, eight tons on the outdoor unit. So in this case, we are taking advantage of the diversity factor we mentioned earlier. But at this moment in time, I only need one, two, three tons of capacity out of the eight. Um, so what that means is the individual um, EFTVs inside these units are going to modulate down. I know in the drawing here we're showing them external to the unit, but they are factory installed in the unit and factory controlled by the unit. Uh, and they will modulate down to provide less refrigerant into these systems. And the fan speed will also be reduced to the lowest fan speed we can have for that refrigerant level, uh, low, medium, or high. Since these things are all communicating, um, these zones are going to be telling the outdoor unit exactly how much capacity they need. One ton, two ton, three tons. So the outdoor unit says, I only need three tons, but I'm an eight ton unit. Now in the eight ton unit, we have two compressors in there. One's a fixed speed, one's a variable speed. So in this case, the fixed speed would actually shut off completely. Uh, and then the variable speed one would ramp down from approximately four tons down to three tons capacity. And we only provide the refrigerant needed to take care of these three tons of capacity. Uh, and then as the load increases in the spaces, we would modulate the electronic expansion valves open more, and then we would also speed up the fans if need be to get the BTUs that we need. We like to keep the fan speed as low as we can for the given amount of refrigerant, because that helps out with the sound level, and it also helps out with dehumidification. Um, some additional examples here showing you on the installation side. This is an outdoor unit in the heat pump scenario, so it's only two pipes. So two pipes go down and branch off. In this case, only serving two zones. Usually, you'd have more than that, but this is just for example's sake. Um, so, refrigerant two pipes going to each zone. The green wires, the daisy chain communication going between the two indoor units and the outdoor unit. If I had an optional web box or something like that, I would also bring that daisy chain to those. Um, that's a two-wire daisy chain cable in this case. And I'd also have an additional two wires going down to the space if I wanted to have local space control. Once again, I don't have to have it. I can run them on the return air sensors but most occupants prefer some kind of space control. Um, in many cases, we might also recommend that you put ball valves in to isolate indoor units. That way, if you needed to relocate one to a different, different location because of a, a reconfig, or if you had a problem with one and you needed to work on it or replace it, um, you'd be able to shut off that particular zone uh, and still have the rest of the system doing his thing uh, while you worked on one of the zones. Uh, Three-pipe system is pretty similar. Obviously, there's one additional pipe, the third pipe. In reality, there's actually four pipes on the three-pipe system and three on the two because there's also that condensate line you don't want to forget about. So we're talking about three refrigeration pipes here. The fourth pipe would be the you know condensate line with water running through it. Uh, but same thing, three pipes instead of two in this case. Uh, same daisy chain communication cable going from each one with two wires. Same two wires down to the optional stats if I want to use it. The big difference on the installation other than the extra pipe is I'm going to have these boxes on here, these distribution boxes that go to the zones that take three pipes in and two pipes come out. Um, that's so that this unit can decide, well, which do I want? Do I want basically the warm refrigerant or do I want the cool refrigerant right now? Do I want heating or cooling? And he'll tell this box which one to do. And over this five wire standard thermostat cable that goes from the indoor unit to the distribution box, uh, it'll open up the solenoid valves to let the correct refrigerant flow into this unit. Um, the reason it's a two-piece thing like this is so all the same indoor units can be used for two-pipe or three-pipe systems. And then the ones that are three-pipe, you just add these boxes on. Um, same kind of discussion on valves and so forth. Those solenoid boxes can be used one per indoor unit, or if the same indoor units are going to be controlled as a, as a zone together, like we're showing up here, these three you know, red indoor units are all serving one common room, for example. They could all be on the same solenoid valve box. Instead of having you know, three individual ones, I can have them all game together. But I wouldn't mix that zone with the one across the hallway or something like that. So there's some flexibility there. Uh, Andrew asks, how often does the system need to operate the defrost cycle with the heat recovery system? Um, defrost cycle, as with all heat pumps, is a function of the uh, humidity 
um, that you have and the, uh, the ambient um, temperature of the outdoor unit. Uh, with that being said, I can't give you an exact amount of minutes because it'll be different for every scenario. All I can probably say for the purpose of your question is that it'll be less than a traditional system because, as you'll see in a little bit here, sometimes the, uh, the outdoor unit is really an indoor unit in another space inside the building. So I'll show you, show you that in a second here, and maybe that'll make a little bit more sense. So the answer for right now, Andrew, is it'll operate defrost less, but I can't quantify it on a given, without having a given job to look at. Um, VRF manufacturers use lots of different piping systems. Um, the first one on the left here is by Manufacturer M, we'll call them. Um, they have a, a, uh, a home run type system, if you will. Each one of these indoor units has two pipes running back to a main branch controller uh, that's being fed from the VRF unit outside. Um, their claim to fame is less, less piping connections. However, the penalty is that you typically have more pipe, sometimes significantly more pipe, sometimes 100% more pipe. Uh, the drawing in the middle um, would be what we use for Panasonic. Uh, it's also used by Manufacturer D, if you will, which is the largest VRF manufacturer in the world. It's a distributed type system. Um, so these, these uh, indoor units uh, would all have two pipes going to their individual distribution boxes and then three pipes um, back to the main, main outdoor unit. Um, so refrigerant gets supplied down the middle of the building and then branches off, if you will, versus the one on the left is a home run type system. Uh, then the one on the far right, that, that third drawing on there, is kind of a hybrid of those two ideas that some of the manufacturers are starting to use. Um, one of those manufacturers happens to be Toshiba Carrier, which is a line that we'll be using here at TEC shortly. Um, we'll still have the Panasonic uh, and, and Sanyo type brand, but because we are a carrier distributor, we'll also have access to the Carrier and Toshiba product. Um, so we will have both, and depending on which is better for the right application, etc., or what what state we're doing a job in, things like that, we'll kind of kind of decide that. Uh, Chuck asks if the controllers have the ability to do diagnostics on some of the problems for the units. Um, and the answer is probably yes. Um, it is a DDC controlled unit, so very similar to like a carrier chiller or rooftop unit, you will get instead of blinking light error codes, you'll get through the through the web box or through the building automation system, you'll get, you know, a text English des description of what the failed item is, and then obviously you'll have to go troubleshoot that particular item. So it's very similar to other factory DDC and con controlled equipment that you've worked in on the past, whether it's chillers, boilers, rooftop units, etc. Um, we typically are using two compressors in most units, uh, especially when we get to the six and eight ton size we're doing that, the three and five tons, not so. Um, but the advantage there is that we can use one fixed speed and one variable speed. Obviously, a fixed speed unit costs a little bit less, um, but I don't have to use it all the time. So in this case, the yellow box is showing you the fixed speed compressor number two. The number one compressor is the variable speed. So when the load's really small down here on the right, the variable speed's doing his thing. The fixed speed is off. But then as I ramp up, up, and up until I get to, say, approximately 50%, then I would turn the fixed speed on and ramp the variable speed down to, to its minimum, and then as the load keeps going, I'd ramp the variable speed up. So you can pretty much hit anything from, you know, whatever, you know, 10% to 100% capacity with those combination of two compressors. So let's look at what happens on a three-pipe system in the, various, in the various modes here. So on the left over here with the red dotted line around it, that's my outdoor unit, um, condensing unit if you want to call it that, but it's a heat pump, so I'd rather call it an outdoor unit. And I got five indoor units, if you will. It doesn't matter if they're ducted, non-ducted, whatever. Um, it's an 8-ton unit, and inside I got two, four, I got 8 tons of cooling in this example, so it matches up in this example. Um, these guys are all in the full cooling mode right now, so these indoor units are all evaporators. The outdoor coils are condensers. The uh, discharge valves are open. The suction valves are closed. Both my fixed speed and my variable speed compressor are running fully to get my 8 tons. It's basically operating like a giant condensing unit like you've worked on for your whole life, with the exception of I have five evaporators instead of one large evaporator. If I switch to the heating mode, um, and I'm going to talk about heating in terms of tons for the rest of today, just to make it easier to think about heating and cooling together, but one ton of heating is 12,000 BTUs, just like it is on the cooling side. Um, so in this case, I got eight tons of heating on my indoor units, eight ton on the outdoor. The outdoor unit is my evaporator in this case, in the heating mode, and my indoor units are condenser coils, so my discharge uh, valves are closed, my suction valves are open, and because I'm asking for the full eight tons, both compressors are fully running. Now, let's look at another scenario um, where I'm going to mix heating and cooling units at the same time. 
Um, so spring, fall, season, things like that. In this example, I have two zones, each two tons calling for cooling. So I need four tons of cooling. And I need one ton of heating right now. Since cooling is the larger load, the outdoor unit goes to the cooling mode, which means the, uh, the discharge valve for the smaller of the two coils is going to be open, my suction valves will be closed, and the discharge valve for the big coil will also be closed. Um, I'm going to turn off um, my fixed speed compressor, and then I'm going to operate my variable speed compressor down to four tons. So I'm going to have four tons of compression running, providing cool refrigerant, if you will, to my two um, cooling zones. But I still got this one ton to get, that needs heating over here. So what I'm going to do is modulate the valve on the outdoor unit that goes to my outdoor coil down to three tons of capacity. So I'm only going to condense three tons outside. That fourth ton, I'm going to condense inside. So I got four tons evaporating inside on, in their zones for those two cooling zones, condensing three tons outside, condensing the fourth ton inside into that other zone. So I'm basically getting five tons of heating and cooling capacity for the compressor pumping horsepower of four tons for the heat rejection price to the outdoors of three tons. So obviously you can see where the energy savings is going to start happening here. Oh, and by the way, I'm not running a boiler or electric heater for that heating zone. So not only am I saving energy on the cooling rejection side with this heat reclaim scenario, but I'm also saving the heating energy for the heating zone that I, that I don't have to heat anymore. Uh, if it's the opposite scenario and I have more guys needing heating than cooling, so in this case, two, two, one, one, so that's uh, six tons of heating and two tons of cooling are currently needed. So these four heating zones become um, condenser coils. The cooling zone is an evaporator. Since heating is the bigger load, the outdoor unit also becomes an evaporator. Um, I'm going to run the compressors at six tons of capacity. So I'm going to ramp them from eight tons down to six tons because I only got six tons of heating that I need. I'll condense my six tons of heating into these, uh, into these zones and I'll evaporate four tons outside and evaporate the other two tons inside. I've always got to be evaporating and condensing the same tonnage, right? And the system doesn't really give a crud if I evaporate it and condense it outside or inside, as long as I put it in the right room, right? So I got six tons of heating um, plus two tons of cooling. I have eight tons of heating and cooling capacity for the compressor horsepower pumping of six tons for the heat rejection price of four tons. Um, plus I'm not running a boiler or electric heater for any of these heating zones. So we can see with the three pipe systems on how the energy savings can, can be quite large if I got zones that need heating and cooling at the same time. And actually that's something I should, should, should mention as well. Traditionally we've told folks when we're putting in you know, zone systems like multiple condensing units, multiple rooftops, whatever, we've always said you know, don't mix interior and exterior, don't mix east and west. Group them by exposure. Get one rooftop for the east, one for the west, one for the south, one for the core. We've always told people that. It works very well for zoning purposes. Life is good. Uh, and if you have a two-pipe heat pipe system, that rule will still apply. However, when you go to the three-pipe heat reclaim system, we actually give you a completely different recommendation. We say, find as many zones as you possibly can where they normally would not be grouped together. Get as many interior core zones that need cooling year-round to be grouped with a bunch of zones on the perimeter that need reheat, right? Or group the east zones with the west zones. Please, please do it. So we got heating needs and cooling needs at the opposite times of the day. Uh, the more times I can group the unlike zones, the more times I can shove energy between them like we're doing in this picture and not have to shove the energy outside or suck the energy from outside. So on a three-pipe heat reclaim system, mix and matching zones that, that have different heating and cooling requirements is ideal. And then in the perfect world, we'd have as much heating and cooling exactly lined up. So in this case, four tons of heating, four tons of cooling. This last zone is off. Um, I would be running this guy with all of the outdoor coils shut off, all the valves not being being utilized. I would have one compressor off, the other one would be running at four tons. So I'd be running the compressor for four tons of heating for these two zones, um, condensing their heat in those zones, and I'd be evaporating the four tons over in the next two zones, I'm basically just pumping around. So I got eight tons of heating and cooling capacity for the compressor pumping power of four tons for the heat rejection price of zero, and I've avoided putting my boiler or electric heater on. All right, so heating in general at the zone uh, level. And if you guys have more questions, type them in the box there, and I'll try to, try to help answer them. Uh, a traditional heat pump, um, we would have had a constant volume compressor with a constant volume condenser fan. Um, it would be on-off control. The indoor unit would be a constant volume fan. It would be a pretty basic system. Uh, I traditionally would have sized this for the cooling capacity. Um, 
because it's the smaller of the heating and cooling for most buildings. I would have sized it for the cooling capacity, and it would have been fine in the cooling, but in the heating mode, it, it would not have been able to carry the load. And I couldn't size it for heating and provide you more BTUs because then in the cooling mode, the heat pump would have been grossly oversized, and I would, don't have any way to modulate it, so it would just be on-off control, and my dehumidification would, uh, would suffer horribly because of that. Chuck, I see your question, and we're going to get to the energy stuff in one second here. Um, so with the VRF system, we are using a variable system. So we have variable speed compression. We have variable speed outdoor fans, which is key. We have either variable speed or staged indoor fans, and we have a modulating electronic expansion valve. Now that I can control all of these things, I can size the system for the heating BTUs instead of cooling. And then in the cooling season, ramp it down so that I don't have those dehumidification problems. I can't get, can't get crazy with it and, you know, and, and have it be totally lopsided from heating to cooling. But for normal stuff in the Chicago area here, typically we, in a commercial building, we can handle it and size it for heating and then ramp everything down in the cooling mode. So to give you some examples of that, um, this chart here shows you outdoor air temperatures from minus 10 to 60 degrees on the bottom, capacity from 0 to 100% to 140% uh, of VTU capacity of this particular system. If I look at a given line, say this purple magenta-ish line with a 68 degree wet bulb, uh, at most our outdoor temperatures I'm doing good, I can handle all the heating that I need, then in this example I get down to, I don't know, 27, 28 degrees, I don't have enough capacity anymore, so it starts dropping off, I'm making less and less capacity and I'm making, at minus 10 degrees in this case, I'm making 58% of my capacity. That means everything below, whatever I said, 27 degrees, I got to have an additional supplemental source of heat to take care of this triangle. Whether that's a boiler, baseboard, electric, whatever, something has to take care of this triangle. Now I just got done telling you guys earlier, we don't have very many hours below 20 degrees, but we do have those hours, so we do have to have a way to heat it. So if I size the system for the cooling mode, that means I'm not going to have enough capacity in heating, and I have to have a supplementary source for the heating. Now, if I were to size the system for the heating mode instead of cooling, because heating is a larger BTU requirement, at least in our climate, Similar thing would happen, I'm moving along the line, eventually I don't have enough capacity, uh, I start dropping off, but I'm dropping off, I'm still bigger, more capacity than I had before. So what I've done here is I sized it for 100% of the capacity on a minus 10 degree day. Right? So I'm able to handle all of the heating requirements for all the days of the year without any additional heating sources, no boiler, no electric heat, no nothing. And then in cooling mode, I can ramp it all down. Um, this is something we can do on most projects. Uh, if your heating requirement is significantly significantly greater than what a traditional cooling requirement would have been, then we might not be able to do it. But on a lot of product products, we can. Uh, and the choice to do it or not, size it for heating or cooling, often depends on what else you already got. If you've got an existing building that already has a boiler with baseboard on it, chances are we're going to size the VRF for cooling, so it's lower cost than a larger VRF would be. And on days when it's really cold, say below 20 degrees, the boiler will have to kick on and supplement the baseboard or radiators or whatever you had in there. However, if it's a new building and you have no heating plant and no heating systems, then perhaps we would do the opposite and size it for the heating mode and let the heat pump do all the work. So it just kind of depends on the scenario and the application. All right, so on some of the costs of these systems, before we dive into it a little bit here, I just want to point out that um, we can't look at just the cost of the outdoor unit and the evaporators, uh, the indoor units, excuse me. Um, because there's lots of other things involved here. You definitely have to take energy usage into account. Um, you definitely have to consider labor. Is it cheaper to install pipe or ductwork on a given building? You've got to think about the building automation system because the VRF system has built-in DDC controls anyway. Every manufacturer of VRF gives you DDC. You have to have it. There's no other way to do it, and it's included in the price of the units. Whereas a VAV system, for example, the controls are an additional cost. So you have to take you know, the air handlers, the chillers, the VAV boxes and the controls and add them all together to compare it to a VRF system. And there's a few other things that do occasionally come up, like, you know, some people will claim, oh, you can build a shorter building, remove some of the height of each floor and make it all, you know, make, make 10 stories fit and nine stories worth of building. And yeah, that's true on a new construction thing, but I don't know a lot of people that are actually doing it, so I wouldn't really base my decisions on that unless your architect wants to do that. But for most buildings, it's going to be a retrofit and it's really going to be, uh, thinking about the labor and controls when I add up all the costs. So let's do that for a quick couple systems here. If you guys have questions, type them in the chat box in the bottom right, and we'll try to address them here. So the first one is a packaged rooftop system, VAV. 
Uh, and I'm only comparing to VAB systems right now because the whole the, the main purpose someone would buy a VRF is to get individual zone control, and energy kind of comes along for the ride. Um, so on a VAB system, that's the airside equivalent. I want to get individual zone control. I'm not comparing it to a 50-ton constant volume unit because that's not an application that would have warranted a VRF system. So we're looking at a zone control versus a zone control. So I'd have the rooftop um, that may or may not come with controls in it, and I got the VAV boxes, which I definitely have to add my own controls to, and I have to program those controls to work with the rooftop, versus the VRF system where I have an outdoor unit and the indoor units, all with the controls already in them. In both cases, I'm going to be running a daisy chain cable from device to device, so that's pretty comparable. Uh, hanging a VAV box is very similar to the effort in hanging a VRF indoor unit, uh, especially if there's hot water coils on the VAV boxes and or fans. Um, so the labor is fairly, fairly similar. Um, when all is said and done, in most cases, the rooftop from a first cost perspective is probably going to be beating the VRF system. Um, if it's new construction, the rooftop is probably always going to win. Um, the only time the VRF is going to win the first cost battle here is if you have an existing building that that doesn't currently have a ducting system, so like hydronic heating, uh, and now you're adding cooling, so you've got to add duct work. Now the VRF becomes probably a, a better first cost choice. Or if you've got situations where the roof cannot handle the weight of the rooftop unit, then maybe the VRF becomes a better choice. But usually the VAV is going to win on a first cost basis until I start talking about energy. However, if I compare this against a traditional hydronic system, um, and by the way, I should have also pointed out on here, I'm going to have to have some way to take care of outside air with the VRF, either an ERV supplying air in or a DOS or operable windows or something like that. Um, if I compare it against a chilled water system, the VRF is still the same, obviously. Indoor units, outdoor units, controls are all built in. Um, on the air side system, i got the VAV boxes still, but now I'm going to go to an air handler, whether it's a traditional or a semi-custom type thing. i got an air handler which typically doesn't come with controls, and I'm going to have to field overlay. I'm going to have to put a boiler plant in or electric heaters, and I've got to control all that. I've got to put a chiller in, and the chiller, if it's water-cooled, I'll also have cooling towers. If it's air-cooled, it'll all be in one assembly. But by the time I add all these pieces, chillers, boilers, air handlers, VAV boxes, and overlay all the controls to do all that, in almost all cases, the VRF is going to beat the chilled water on a first-cost basis. Um, so so the, kind of the highest you know, tier... For these zone systems is going to be hydronic, the middle cost tier is going to be VRF, and the lower cost tier is going to be a rooftop unit. Obviously, that's going to change based on project to project, but that's kind of like the, the summary rule of thumb way to look at it. Uh, real quick, Aaron has a question. What are the hazards of having that much refrigerant in a school environment? Uh, the hazards are the same as every other project, um, school or otherwise. Um, ASHRAE 15 standard does a good job of detailing what you can and can't do with refrigerant. Um, generally speaking, DX systems, whether they're VRF or traditional splits, um, the biggest thing you pay attention to is, if I were to get a leak in the refrigerant system, what's the smallest room that I would be leaking the refrigerant into? Because I basically have all this refrigerant volume that could leak into the smallest room. So that's the critical number we look at for ASHRAE 15 to figure out if we have too many pounds of refrigerant in the system or not. Uh, if you're doing something with very small zones, like I showed you that CHA project we did with a local consulting engineering firm, um, and obviously that's kind of like a, a living environment, so you got all these you know, 800,000 square foot zones, these little tiny zones um, that are all sealed off from the other zones. So in that case, we couldn't put very large systems on there. We had a lot of 8-ton systems on there because we couldn't do a bunch of 20-ton systems because there had been too much refrigerant per the ASHRAE rules that could accidentally leak into a space. There's an excellent ASHRAE article on ASHRAE 15 and applying it specifically to VRF systems. If you need help with that, uh, send me an email later. I'll give you my email at the end here, and I will uh, send you the link to that um, white paper, or uh, rather, ASHRAE journal article on how to apply VRF systems and follow the ASHRAE 15 uh, guidelines for refrigerant. Uh, Mr. Wang is asking if you change the compressor speed by changing the frequency or the voltage. Um, generally speaking, um, variable speed compressors are done by changing the frequency through an inverter. Um, so efficiencies of different types of equipment as compared to VRF. So on the left is typical cooling systems, um, residential and small commercial systems, as you probably know, under five tons are rated in SEER. Um, large rooftops and split systems are rated in EER, and now more, more currently IEER, which takes into account part load efficiency. Uh, chillers are rated in EER and IER. Water-cooled chillers are rated in IPLV. 
What I try to do here is convert all of those to an equivalent COP, coefficient of performance. Because the problem with all these things, SEER, EER, IER, et cetera, is that they're not the same for every kind of product here. So if I want to compare two condensing units and look at EER, that's fine. If I want to compare a condensing unit versus a VRF system, it's not going to help me at all. So what I try to do is boil them down to the equivalent COP so we can look at that directly. And then I also want to point out with the chillers here, unlike uh, refrigerant-based systems like split systems or VRF, chillers, they don't include any of the, the pumping and energy and so forth in the, in, the, in the efficiency of the machine. It's just the machine itself. So it's not a direct comparison. On the heating side, I did the same thing. I tried to put everything into terms of COP. Electric heat is perfect heat, right? It's one COP by definition. All the power I buy gets turned into heat. There might be a slight line loss, but for the most part, that's the discussion. Uh, gas furnaces and boilers, I think that the most efficient boiler I've seen on the market is 98% efficient. Same with the furnace. So the best COP you can get is 0.98. Uh, typical rooftop unit, the, the most of them the, are between 80 and 82%. Um, well, there are a couple manufacturers working on some 90% now. Uh, heat pumps down here, uh, 13 HSPF, which is basically 3.8 COP. Um, so you can kind of see an idea of what, what the typical efficiencies are of these various equipments. Uh, VRF now, as of a year and a half ago or so, has its own rating system with AHRI. AHRI makes all the rating systems for all these other groups as well. Uh, before that, we would just basically calculate it manually to help people compare. Well, now they have their own rating system. Now all the major VRF manufacturers test in accordance with that rating system and then publish their data. And you can see all that data at www.ahridirectory.org. That's where you can look up VRF, furnaces, boilers, everything's pretty much on there. Here's a snapshot of one of the pages of a VRF system lookup, just to give you an idea of what you would see. Um, typically, you're going to get the cooling and heating data. Uh, and the main, two main things that, that the AHRI is concerned with testing are the capacity and the efficiencies of these pieces of equipment. Uh, so for cooling mode, capacity and BTUs, EER is the full load efficiency. If I run this thing full out, 100% power, how, how much how efficient is it, going, is it going to be in terms of EER? And IEER is the part load efficiency, uh, basically running it at part capacity at 25, 50, 75, or 100 percent capacity, and then weighting the middle numbers, 50 and 75, most heavily in the math formula. Uh, heating scenario is represented in terms of COP. Heat pumps in general, not just VRF, but all heat pumps are rated at 47 degrees and 17 degrees. The reason the 47 degree number came about, it sounds like an odd number, but from the heating standpoint, it's actually the inverse of the 95 degree rating point we would have for cooling. So the difference between indoor temperature and the 95 degree outdoor for cooling is basically the same as indoor temperature and 47 degrees for heating. It's kind of how that originally evolved and then we just kind of stuck with it over the decades. Uh, but then heat pumps also started getting rated at 17 degrees so you can sort of kind of see the, the penalty for the cooler outside air, if you will. So if you know those two points, 47 and 17, if you take a pretty good guess at what, how much capacity and efficiency you're going to be at for, for other temperatures. So you can see, what did we say a furnace or boiler was? Uh, the best is going to be 0.98 COP. Well, this guy, even at 17 degrees, is over 2 COP. That means for every unit of power that I buy, I'm getting 2 to 2 and a quarter um, out of it. So if I bought 1 kW of electricity, I'm going to get 2 kW of heating capacity on this system. Um, some of your customers may be like, well, what the hell, Ryan? How can I get, get more capacity than I actually bought? But then you have to remember with a heat pump, unlike electric strip heaters, furnaces, boilers, and all that kind of stuff, is that a heat pump does not make heat. Right? I'm not burning a fuel to produce heat into my airstream. What I'm doing is moving heat. I'm only paying to move it from outside to inside. Right? The very first slide that we showed, I'm only moving the heat from outside to inside. I'm not making the heat. So it's much more efficient and cost effective for me to move it than make it. Now, the other thing you have to always think about is what are the costs of gas and electric in these discussions? If gas is really cheap and electric is really high, then even though the heat pump is more efficient than a gas source, sometimes the gas source may, may be more cost effective, even though it's not more efficient. Um, and generally speaking, for commercial buildings, I haven't done this for about a year or so. But the last time I did the math on a job, uh, it came out to be about 4 degrees or so outdoor air temperature on, on a Sanyo VRF system. And I believe that one was what was it at the time? It was two eight tons, so it was a six ton system. So at four degrees outside and below, it was cheaper for us to run the 70 some percent gas boiler that they currently had. Uh, at above four degrees, it was cheaper to run the heat pump. Um, so you can kind of do those balance, balance math.
if you will, to figure out which one's cheaper to run when. Um, it is, even though we don't publish all the way down to minus 10, um, you can get, can get data from manufacturers down to that point. Uh, it's probably not going to be 2.4 COP. I'm sure this was the, the, the absolute best scenario one that they made the slide for here. Uh, but it's probably going to be like 1.7, 1.8, something like that. You can see over here at 17 degrees it was 2. So if I drop down another 20 degrees or whatever, um, it's going to be it's going to be less, but it'll still be still be better than electric strip heat. Heat pumps in every scenario, all the time, no matter what, always beat electric strip heat um, for cost effectiveness because all those can be 100% efficient. This guy's you know two three hundred percent efficient for heating. Um, here to show you an example of some of the IERs um, that are that are captured under that new HRI standard and comparing them against the ASHRAE ninety point one two thousand and ten um, minimum code requirement values. Uh, and you can see that in most cases, all the heat pumps that that we we have in every size uh, significantly beat the code minimums. Uh, and the best one, as you can see there, is 63% more efficient than the minimum code requirement. Um, so these are pretty pretty efficient systems. Uh, Chuck asks if these systems qualify for, for prescriptive energy rebates. I'm assuming you're referring to utility companies, Chuck, specifically electric utilities. Uh, the answer currently is no. BRF is not a prescriptive rebate, um, nor is rooftops or any other DX system. There are no DX systems on the ComEd um, prescriptive rebate path. Um, so all DX systems would be a custom rebate application if you wanted to look at them that way. So VRF is treated the same as other condensing units and heat pumps for the purpose of the rebates. Um, we'll skip that one in the interest of time, just showing that VRF can uh, sometimes, depending on the loading, be more efficient than air or water-cooled uh, machines. Uh, but I'd rather look at this one to compare chilled water to VRF. It does a little bit better job. Um, so one of the problems that we've had so far, and remember we're TEC, so we're a carrier distributor, and we sell tons of chillers, and we don't want to stop that by any means. So, But we can take an objective look at chilled water versus VRF on a given project and try to figure out which one's going to be better for the building, because we don't really care, because we're going we're gonna to work with you on either one of them kind of thing. But just to give you an example here, um, if I take, and this is showing um, the, the, uh, the ASHRAE, um, minimums for the code, if you will. So all these green bars along the bottom, all those green ones, that's how efficient the chiller is, right? Or how much energy it uses, I should say. The blue bars right next to them is how much the VRF system uses. So you can see in all cases, the VRF system uses more energy than the chiller does. However, with the chiller, you have lots of other energy components that you need to add back in that won't be represented. So you can't just look at the efficiency of the chiller that's published in the VRF system and then compare them. You have to look at the whole system probably with energy modeling or something like that. But in this example, we did this, and I'm saying we, this is actually an AHRI slide uh, that they did for uh, last year for the, uh, the rollout of this. Um, so the yellow buckets are the cooling tower energy. The next bar is the uh, condenser water pumps. The little gray bars are the chill water pumps. Uh, and then the dark blue bars are the air handler fan energy. So when I add all that stuff in, now remember, the VRF already has the distribution energy, which is the compressor pumping power. It already has the fan energy in its rating system, which chillers do not. So it's already in one number, if you will. So I've got to add all that stuff back into the chiller. Now you can see this black line shows you the VRF system where all those blue lines kind of meet. In every scenario, it beats the chiller in terms of efficiency. Now you can get a super awesome efficient chiller you know, with variable speed cooling towers and all that stuff and find some systems that will beat the VRF, like a Carrier 23XRB, for example. But looking at the traditional, like say air-cooled chiller with traditional ASHRAE um, efficiencies, the VRF system is going to beat it every time. So you got to kind of look at it holistically, if you will. Uh, energy modeling is one way to do that. I know that eQuest software has it built in. Energy Pro has it built in. Uh, I heard some of the other software tools might have it as well, um, but I've not verified those. But there are ways to, to model the VRF without bastardizing your program. You know, model it by, by checkdown box, if you will. All right, a couple of quick items on installation. I know we're already five minutes over, but I kind of want to get the last couple of thoughts captured for you guys here. Um, so just looking at a few of those. Um, one of the things we always talk about with VRF is the maximum distances. Most people have done condensing units that have limits of 75, 100, 150 feet, sometimes 200 feet of distance you can have for certain condensing unit systems, split systems. Uh, VRF is completely different. All the manufacturers of VRF, Panasonic included, have significantly longer maximum lengths of piping 
than a traditional split system. So you can see here, depending on the scenario, I can have four or 500 feet of distance. Um, I can handle some pretty, pretty high uh, vertical drops, 100, 150 feet um, from condensing unit down to the, to the indoor units. Um, the distances are significantly longer than any of the rules of thumb you have in your head from other DX systems. Um, to make it easier, we use software tools to, to not only uh, lay out the system and size it and so forth, um, but also, and very importantly, to um, size the pipe and to check the maximum distance rules. So every time we do one of these systems, the software will pop up saying, hey, your total feet is this for this particular rule. Here's the maximum. You're good, 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 good kind of thing. And this one here, one of them wasn't good, so we have to go back and look at that particular one kind of thing. Um, so there's several different rules di dictated over here, uh, but the software tools we use are going to help us try to stay within those rules. But usually, you can do six, eight-story buildings uh, on one system, and, and you can have system, you can have condensing units on the roof serving systems down. You can have other ones down on, on the ground serving systems up, depending on your, your location of your building. Um, that one building that we had showed you has some of the condensing units sitting on a I'm going to call a shelf above the loading docks um, for all the earlier floors, and then all the top floors are served by, by the roofs. Um, so there's different ways to kind of do that. Um, some of the various, uh, uh, well, hang on one second here. Andrew asks, why can we get the longer distances? Um, it basically comes down to um, oil return on the refrigerant system, Andrew. Um, traditional condensing units have difficulty um, keeping the oil in the compressor, right? Obviously, we want the oil in the compressor because that's the reason we need the oil to begin with. Um, but in many systems, oil gets dispersed down throughout the system. So if you want to take a regular condensing unit for longer runs, you typically have to do some refrigerant, refrigeration engineering, if you will, and install double suction risers and stuff like that um, to kind of get the refrigerant um, to make its way back to the system. Well, what happens differently on the VRF system, well, there's two things that happen differently, um, is that the, man, the oil, for one, is reclaimed at the compressor discharge. So there's a filter there trying to grab all that oil, grabbing it off the discharge, and dumping it back onto the inlet side of the compressor to keep as much there as possible. Obviously, some of it's going to get out of the system, and over time, a lot of it will get out into the system. The other thing VRF has unique to it that a traditional DX system does not is that that VRF outdoor unit is in full communication with all of the indoor units, and hence the electronic expansion valves associated with them. So there's a little thermistor sensor down in the sump of the two compressors in the outdoor unit. And as the oil kind of lowers its level in the sump, the, the thermistor will be exposed to more air and gas, if you will, than it is oil, which is at a different temperature. So it'll say, oh, crap, I don't have enough oil anymore. Um, so what it'll do is it'll send a signal out to all of his zones and say, hey, guys, uh, I don't have enough oil, so I need your help. I need you guys all to open up your electronic expansion valves wide open. I'm going to run this compressor full on, balls out, full capacity, and I'm going to try to shove all that refrigerant and oil back around the loop of the system and shove it back to me where I can reclaim it. Um, so that's kind of the idea there is that since I can talk to all the indoor units and directly control the expansion valves from the outdoor unit when I need to in a low oil situation, I can get all that oil back to me. Whereas a traditional system, there's no discussion between the indoor refrigerant pieces and the outdoor refrigerant pieces. They don't know each other exists. So that's really kind of how they, they can, these VRF manufacturers can do that kind of thing. All right, so some of the components here that are involved, obviously the outdoor unit, obviously the indoor unit, thermostats if you want them, or you can use return sensors, condensate pumps, um, depending on whether you have to add it in the field or whether it's factory installed. There's these distribution joints that go on each of the pipes. Um, typically, we call them uh, Y fittings. Um, so the pipe comes down from the condensing unit, goes into the Y fitting, and then the Y fitting branches off into, you know, in this case, down to zone one and then down to zone two. If there was a third zone, there'd be another Y fitting here, and another one, and another one. Um, the reason we have the Y fittings, and we provide these Y fittings with the units, the reason we have those is because we don't want people using T's and other restrictive devices. The Y fitting is going to allow us to get better refrigerant flow, less friction, and hence that's also going to help with some of those long, long line lengths. So on a three-pipe system, we'd have three of them at each takeoff, um, and they'd be sized for the BTUs, and then the next one would be sized for the BTUs, the next one, the next one, the next one. And then the last one obviously doesn't need one because, well, because he's the last one. If it's a three-pipe system, we'll also have the solenoid box that switches the three pipes to the two that I need for the given mode, heating or cooling. And then I'd also be wise to use some isolation valves to shut these zones off so I can work on one zone while my other ten zones do their thing or whatever. Um, we're not allowed to, uh, to do anything special on the refrigerant piping. 
Um, so pretty much because we're doing this oil management system and that's what's getting us our long runs and the Y fittings and all that, they don't want any other devices on there that are going to cause any unnecessary friction or confusion. Um, we don't need any risers and, and trap type stuff because we're doing all the oil management through the control system. So we don't need double suction risers, speed risers, any of that kind of stuff. Um, we're not adding any extra accumulators. We don't want any sight glasses on here. For charging, you're going to weigh the, the refrigerant in. You know, check it with gauges. You're not going to do, use sight glasses to do it. Um, no filter dryers unless you had a you know, problem and you're putting one on there temporarily to clean something up in your piping, obviously. Um, but getting rid of all these restrictions on the system is, is the goal of these manufacturers. So all that stuff's no longer used. Um, just talking about that. Um, we already talked about the oil management, recover the oil after discharge of the compressor, and then if needed, do a system flush that flushes all the oil back around the loop by opening up all the expansion valves at every zone. Uh, that's not going to happen very often. This is going to be whatever, every few months or something like that, the cycle might happen as needed, uh, depending on how much oil has been pushed into the system. All right, last couple notes on the installation side, and then we'll wrap it up with final questions. Um, as with all heat pumps, we're going to insulate all the lines. Uh, I know in AC systems, we typically insulate one and not the other. On heat pumps, we insulate both uh, because the pipes can be either basically a heating pipe or a cooling pipe you know, at a given time of, of year based on the reversing valve. So we're going to insulate all the lines so we don't have any loss of energy that way. Um, one of the benefits is that since this is a refrigerant-based system, we don't have to deal with water balancing, and we might not have to deal with air balancing, although in many of these systems we paired with a ventilation system, so you would have it on that side, obviously. Um, there's no pumps to mess with, um, no large ducts to try to fit into congested spaces. Um, the manufacturers all do recommend that we use uh, soft copper ACR tubing, um, and they would prefer that we don't solder 20-foot sticks of copper together. They prefer that we have you know, long 100-foot line sets that we're using, basically, because that'll be less friction on the inside of the pipe because it's one smooth uh, surface on the inside. You can use uh, you know, hard copper you know, in sticks if you need to, you know, to appease your local code guy or whatever. Um, but if you can, line sets would be better. Um, I'm going to recommend that the lines are purged before anything's brazed. That's probably true from every manufacturer of every DX system these days, so nothing really special there. Um, we provide all of the Y branch fittings, if you will, um, and the insulation um, boxes, if you will, that go around the Y fittings. Uh, and then we do recommend ball valves at the zone level for isolation reasons. Uh, so basically, you can probably have up to about 40 indoor units on a single dual or, I should say, a triple condensing unit system. And obviously, you can have more and more systems on the same building if you need to. Uh, you can do simultaneous heating and cooling if you do the uh, three-way, you know, three-pipe type system. The heating efficiencies are very high compared to other heating systems, um, but you do have to take into account gas versus electric costs and things like that. The main driving reason to put a VRF system in is individual zone control. Um, there's also pretty good dehumidification at the zone level we didn't talk about because we are slowing down the local fans at the zone level uh, in addition to modulating the refrigerant flow. Um, but you're mainly doing it for zone control, and high efficiency kind of comes along for the ride. Um, you could get that same kind of zone control with a four-pipe boiler chiller system, um, but running the four pipes on a new install would probably be cost prohibitive, and we already talked about the equipment and the controls, um, so it is a more cost-effective way to do zone control. Get rid of the cooling towers, the chemicals, the makeup water, all that stuff can go away. Um, the controls are all built into the units, factory installed. The indoor and outdoor units, they're already set up to work with each other. You're running a daisy chain cable from the units to the indoor units, uh, and then you're telling it, hey, you're zone 1, you're zone 5, you're zone 9, you're zone whatever, uh, and you belong to this condensing unit. That's it. You're not writing any special code or trying to get manufacturer A from the controls world to play nice with manufacturer B of the VAV box world to play nice with manufacturer C of the air helmet world, and then the chiller guy and the boiler guy and all these other people. It's all one. It's all the heating cooling plant. And all the, the zone level controls are all from the same people built into the box, factory installed. Um, you do have some compressor redundancy by having multiple compressors in a single unit, as well as multiple units on a single refrigerant circuit. Um, so that can help you in certain situations if you work on one while the other one's running. Um, of course, if you had some kind of you know, burnout, it probably would be a problem for all of them. Um, but like I said, so far, knock on wood, we have not replaced compressors yet, so we're doing good there. All right, any final discussions? I realize I went over time, uh, so I apologize for that. But if you have any further questions, uh, 
I'll stay on the line here for a couple minutes and see what, what things pop up from you guys. Uh, there is one here I missed. Uh, why COP as high as 3.8 for heating? Are you starting to see heat pumps replace? Oh, with COP as high as 3.8 for heating, are you starting to see heat pumps replace furnaces? I'm assuming you're referring to typical residential type stuff there, Aaron. Um, and we do see heat pumps used on residential applications. In our market, meaning the Chicago market where you're from, Aaron, um, we typically see it as a hybrid system that has both a gas furnace and a heat pump. Because from an efficiency standpoint, the heat pump usually beats the furnace, say, 20 to 60 degrees of outdoor air temperature. But the furnace beats it at the lower temperatures. And I need to have the fan system to move the air anyway. So getting a furnace instead of a fan coil is not that much more money. Um, so we like to combine the furnace with the heat pump. Uh, if you get to more rural areas where electric is the main heating source, then heat pumps are by far a better choice. And we're seeing a lot of heat pump movement there. Or if you get to rural places where propane is the choice instead of natural gas, propane is a lot more expensive than natural gas. Uh, so the costs work out a little bit differently where the heat pump um, can be the furnace on, on a first or an energy cost uh, basis. Um, hope that answers it. Um, Mark's asking if we'll be sending the presentation out. If someone wants a copy of the presentation, um, send me an email, which is up on the screen, and I will send you a link to download it. The recorded version of this presentation will be posted on our website, uh, which is the same website you registered on originally for this webinar. So if you've got a coworker who wants to see it, they can certainly do that. Uh, Don is asking if Panasonic requires a certification class to install VRF. Uh, and I don't believe there's any requirement at the present time for that, Don. Uh, but there are classes available. It's highly recommended. Um, they do have a certification class that they host down in Atlanta. Uh, we have, um, in the past, hosted them locally. Oh, the one in Atlanta is a little bit nicer because they have hands-on equipment also. Um, and then they do host webinars um, from, for both installation and uh, startup commissioning on a regular basis. Typically, there's one of those a month. And then if you've got a project coming up that you need to learn about it before then, they can also host a webinar just for you, uh, you know, on the fly kind of thing for your company. Um, but to answer your question, no, there's no hard requirement to be certified. Um, but training is highly recommended. As with any system that someone has not installed before, you might as well go to training, figure out the right way to do it so you don't have to make as many mistakes in the field. All right, any other questions anybody have? All right, if you have any other questions, um, my contact info is currently up on the screen. You're welcome to reach out to me. Um, we did have one last one pop up, and then I'm going to log off. It's from Jessica. If you add in the cost of dedicated outside air to the VRF, how does it compare with the chiller boiler system in terms of first cost? Um, my, my previous discussion uh, was including, when we look at the cost of that, we are including the cost of having to treat that outside air with an ERV or something like that before we bring it into the VRF units. Um, so. Assuming that you don't have any infrastructure currently, no piping, no nothing, and you're going to buy it from scratch, the VRF system with the refrigerant piping and some kind of ERV makeup air unit is going to typically be less expensive than the boiler, chiller, um, VAV air handler, boxes, and controls. Um, so that is including the VRF, the um, outside air discussion. Now, if they have existing ductwork already in place, then the math changes because they're not buying ductwork for the air handler system. But, so that's kind of the difference, difference there. All right, thank you guys for your time. I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording.